Let's talk about compositionality. Now, did you know that compositionality is a powerful principle which can allow us to endow computation with great versatility, flexibility and expressiveness? Did you know that? Um, this idea of language of thought came from compositionality. What, what are your thoughts about Chomsky? <laughs> Do you like Chomsky? I'm taking this dog home with me. It's amazing. She is great. Absolutely amazing. Um, pa pa is it Patrick Esser? Uh, Lewis. Patrick Lewis, I'm, I'm so sorry. No Patrick. worries. Lovely to meet you. Uh, Lovely you to meet you. Yeah. Talk into the mic. Okay. Um, so you were the guy who wrote this paper about retrieval augmented generation. Yeah, uh, I guess so. I mean, there were papers before here, um, but I was part of a team, um, or led a team that wrote a paper that's kind of captured the modern imagination of like making a simple-ish end-to-end -end model that learns to retrieve and then learns to generate based on what it's retrieved. And we call that model RAG. But yeah, okay. there's a sort of long history of this that stretches back, you know, tens, 20, 30 years, uh, yeah. as with most things in like AI. I can imagine. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited about this because clearly there's the Google Code Red. So they're racing to do something mm -hmm. like this. I think the Bing team are racing to do something like this. The, you know, the, there are lots of problems with language models in terms of like they bullshit, they hallucinate and so on. Absolutely. But, but this ability to go out and get actual, you know, like epistemically true, justified true things and stick them in the prompt. Mm. And then do the generation. I mean, why don't we just like zoom out and you know, give me give me an interesting yeah, paper? Yeah. How does it work? I guess just before, like, just to pick up on on the kind of like language you're using there, I wouldn't call it like epistemically true, but it's more, um, it's like I can support my viewpoint as a human, and I can argue, and you don't necessarily believe me until I give you a source. But even then, you may not believe the source, but at least you've got something to back it up. So like, we can't make language models generate truth what we can do is make them more verifiable so we can produce a generation uh, that might be like a factual claim or a claim about the world that the language model is inhabiting and we can use that mechanism of citation effectively or grounding mm -hmm. um, which is how humans have kind of converged on how to like have kind of scholarly or actual uh, debates and so the language model can generate uh, both this claim and a piece of an artifact from the real world mm -hmm. that it can use to say, oh, here is something that supports my viewpoint here, or here is why I'm saying this. It may not be why, depending on like your views on uh, the definition of why, um, but at least it's saying like, here's something that you can look at, and if you trust this source, then you may trust uh, what I'm saying here. The, the, the why thing is actually really interesting. So I was talking to um, Professor Luciano Floridi last week and, and he, cool. he talks a lot about, um, you know, obviously like pragmatics and, and semantics and like the, the, the information context. So, for mm. example, if you said, is this the same building or is that the right building? Um, if you're just asking for directions, yeah, the building's over there. But um, you might be asking, is it still a hospital? Does it still have the same function? And then the why, the purpose is important. So mm. he said there's like, um, uh, you know, the, the question, the purpose, and the answer. You need three, not two. Question, the purpose, the answer. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, going back to, you know, like all this sort of frenzied uh, um, activity to try and spin up these conversational search interfaces, um, or kind of equivalently turn chat GPT into something that can like cite its sources and ground. And like it makes a ton of sense. Um, there's been this kind of line of work in the in the more of the obscure not obscure but like in academia for a long time. And so I kind of watched this slightly almost bemused and being like, well, of course, you know, <laughs> along this comes and these model as the models get better, they're obviously going to get better at information seeking dialogue, which is like the term that we used for this and then people have made it from information seeking dialogue into information seeking dialogue plus rationales which is something that came in a few years ago and now more with this concept of attribution or grounding or citation they're all kind of different words that describe roughly the same concept but yeah like this is clearly a huge thing that many large teams are working on and some like smaller teams as well
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's something I've like super interested in and I've worked on a lot with my um, ex colleagues and my colleagues here um, throughout my PhD and, and at FAIR and here as well. Amazing. So, how does RAG work exactly? How does RAG work? So, um, there's sort of a like the high level concept, which is a piece of text comes into the model, or yeah. like there's some input, even higher text. Like, if we're not talking about language models, we're just talking about models in general. Something comes in, and we analyze that thing that comes in. And we also have a knowledge base of items. Mm -hmm. um, and we try and figure out for the thing that's come in, what are the most relevant or important things from my knowledge base uh, that might help me produce a desired output. Yep. And we perform a step of retrieval, which can look like generating like an actual search query with a language model, executing it on Google or Bing or whoever, and then taking those search results and then passing them into a second step uh, which is where you take those retrieve results and the initial input, and then you try and figure out the best response based on the on both of these two things. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would describe as RAG is the process of training a model to do both, um, so that you, yeah, it can operate kind of like a standard language model, except in the middle, there's this retrieval going on. Um, and then what you get is sort of better, as we've talked about, interpretability because you can see where the claims might be coming from you can inspect the retrieve documents if it generates these kind of explicit pointers back to the documents you can inspect those um, and you also get other things like a, an aspect of updatability mm -hmm. so language models as i'm sure you've talked about with a bunch of people one of the key flaws is that they take you know a great deal of resources to train and then they're sort of stuck in whatever time yeah. they were trained but if you have a language model with access to a big external memory, yep. like the internet or like a big index of text, you can put things in and take things out. Mm -hmm. And you can then update them to have new knowledge that's come along since. So you could arguably teach Bert about COVID by giving it a Wikipedia index to read, uh, mm -hmm. read um, or like retrieve from on the fly. Um, or you can also remove things as well, which is kind of like a more subtle thing. So let's say there's some bad stuff or something undesirable that your model is conditioning on. Uh, if it's a retrieval augmented model, you can find that thing that it's retrieving and using and remove it. So um, I was involved in a piece of work late last year called Atlas, which is a language model that mm. has this retrieval augmented generator kind of paradigm. And I was looking at the performance of a model, uh, like the performance of the model on a benchmark that people use to, to see how well this, these models do at question answering called MMLU, Massively Multitask Language Understanding. <laughs> and that's a collection of uh, exams, like multiple choice exams, like the SATs mm -hmm. um, or things you might take in high school. Or, um, yeah. There's some university level ones. There's like a lot of them. And what I was doing was looking at the performance and we saw really good performance and then i was looking at the retrieved information that the model was making use of in order to help it answer those questions correctly and what i found is that it was retrieving a lot from stack exchange which was part of the data that we put in there and what would happen is that people had been set these exams for their homework mm -hmm. and they'd gone onto the internet and they just googled the uh, they'd googled it hadn't found it and opened a stack exchange thread you know on the obscure thing they've been asked to do. And that had just been like sitting on the internet. And then we had come along and we'd added Stack Exchange to our information. And we were effectively like cheating or leaking uh, our performance on this data set by retrieving the exact question and the exact answer that someone had Googled, like Googled and then put on Stack Exchange. And that was like not a reflection of what we were trying to measure. We were trying to see whether this was a sort of general purpose system that could use external information to answer its questions, but not like literally just find the same question somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so what we could do with Atlas, which we couldn't have done if this was just a big normal language model, is we just took out Stack Exchange from the data it was training from. And then if we measured this leakage, like looking verbatim for those questions in the things we were retrieving, we didn't have them anymore. So we can then be like, oh, okay, here's how it would do if we've controlled for explicit memorization 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that was something that I didn't, I don't think I grasped completely. So RAG is um, learnable. So it's like, because the, mm -hmm. I guess what I had in my mind can be. was like, you create this computational graph, you go to these operational stores. Mm -hmm. uh, with Google, you might generate a query, but it might be, let's say, a bunch of documents and you've got um, embeddings for them and you select ones with a cosine or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and you kind of fan out and then you get a whole bunch of information back mm -hmm. and you do something with it. Yeah. So there's like, it's a sort of very broad paradigm of like a model that searches and then consumes search results to produce an output. And then relevant to the conversation just now is the, like the, the grounding part, but that's really just part of the generation part. Yeah. Um, within that, there's a whole universe of kind of designs. Um, some people will call RAG this techless sort of area. Um, some people will call it a specific model that was published whenever we did it like three or four years ago. Um, that is like one instance of this type of model. So like there's a sort of a definitional problem that people don't quite have the right terminology to describe this. Um, some people would call like this approach a retro because um, retro is another like example of models in this kind of family that do something pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, right, yeah, and, and then there's the, you know, you can either train a kind of pipeline of these models that's existed for a really long time like train a retrieval system for example to try and retrieve documents that are likely to answer a question mm -hmm. and then plug that into a reader model that takes those passages and the question and tries to extract uh, the actual answer that's been around for a super long time like like tens 20 30 years um but really they're yeah. just evolution of the same kind of idea with more and more powerful models that get stronger um is, yeah. I mean, is it? I know nothing about this, but is that where a lot of the complexity comes in? So when you have diverse, um, you know, operational stores that you aggregate over, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm kind of thinking, if you just go to Google, then that must be much easier than having to kind of like aggregate over five stores. Yeah. So you can either like kind of build your own differentiable store, or you can use Google, or you could do. So like, there's, I guess there's a question about whether it's a black box search engine. Uh, or a differentiable model that you control. Um, and then there's a separate question of like, if it's a black box, what's inside the black box? So that could be Google or it could be Elasticsearch or some other yeah. thing that you can't differentiate with, or you can go the sort of fully diff the mostly differentiable route <laughs> uh, where you have the more um, familiar dense vector um, retrievers that people use and I think you were describing okay. uh, that's how rag works rag is one of those ones with a purpose-built kind of explicit memory with vectors uh, that you train the retriever and you train the generator and you try you basically try and join the train them jointly with mm -hmm. one loss function that's trying to make them both work together but you can train them kind of separately together so you mm. can imagine train the retriever so that it retrieves documents that happen to give you a better likelihood if you plug them into a language model okay and then train the language model to make better use of those documents and then a little bit later go back to the retriever and try and encourage it to retrieve the documents that maximize the probability of the language model so you can kind of do this I'll train the retriever for a bit based on what the language model likes, and I'll train the language model a bit based on what the retriever likes. And you can do this kind of shuffling process. And that means you can, you can train models that um, may not be end-to-end -end differentiable mm -hmm. and kind of exist in their own, you know, they could, you could literally have them training on different servers, um, but you can end up with a system like a model that works together. It's a kind of style of what's called an EM algorithm. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's sort of, sometimes people formalize it that way. Some people just sort of say, hey, we're going to distill some stuff into the retriever now. And hey, we're going to train the language model based on this. Um, so it's, it's all a bit of a wild west and it's more of an empirically driven right now than any like specific way of training these things. Yeah, that, that's um, cool. I, don't, yeah. I think the, the one thing I'm missing is, so the, the retriever model, I mm. think, just gets back a bunch of documents. And because I was kind of thinking yeah. maybe you might have been saying sometimes the retrieval model might actually be a language model decoder itself. 
Ah. But, but, the, but the question is like, how do you get that information from the retrieval model and you have to do something to it and put it in the prompt? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good point. So the retrieval model could be any model, I guess, that takes in the original input and then produces a uh, list of documents from our index. Yeah. So if our index is the entire internet, our retrieval system could look like we put the input and we get let the language model generate a Google search query and we run that through Google. Um, or it could be any kind of other like design, but, um, or it could even be a language model itself uh, mm -hmm. that you've kind of forced to only generate certain types of output. There's, there's work that does that as well. But yeah, so the retrieval part, the kind of signature of the task is input to list of documents. Mm -hmm. And then the second stage is the signature of the task is input list of documents to output. And generally that will look something like concatenating the text of the input, either with the long list of documents together um, or concatenating the input with each of the documents separately, the top K documents, and then feeding them independently through the language model and then right. doing some what's called marginalization at the top to produce a final output but yeah like the prompt either looks like squishing all of the text together or squishing the text with e with the input uh, and putting it through yeah because because the, the the problem we seem to have with the language models is that they have a certain context window size and mm. you know could could be yeah. eight thousand could be four thousand could be two thousand great point and so it's not like we can just stick it all in there you can't stick it all in there but um you can do some things to make it less uh so like you could stick it all in there hmm. but it would take a really long time and it would have a really high memory complexity so the transformers have a quadratic complexity which means like as the sequence gets longer uh it becomes um n squared uh, amount of um memory required to process it mm -hmm. there are some like fancy tricks that you can do to make that less in practice but generally we don't want to have a super long sequence um what you can do instead is this trick that um, we're talking about is basically imagine that you can feed the input with each of your documents independently. And what that looks like is a bit like a batch of standard training. So usually you have like a prompt mm -hmm. and you have a, uh, and you get the language model to generate and you can parallelize that. So you'd usually have a batch of like 16 examples that you throw through. What we could do instead is have the same question uh, with 16 different documents. Yeah. And then you kind of create this batch and you can throw that through a GPU. And that would allow you to effectively process all 16 documents in parallel separately. And then at the top of the language model, you have to do some kind of integration uh, like of, of the, inf inf the information, what we call fusing. Mm -hmm. uh, so fusing information across the documents is like a big deal. And there's various ways you can do it. In the RAG paper, we did this right at the top of the language model. So we're eff effectively, for each document, we are predicting what the next token should be for the output. And then we're saying, okay, so the question plus document one predicts the next token should be A. Uh, the question plus document two predicts the next token should be some of A, but maybe some of B, and document three, for example, might say do um, B. And so what you do is then sum up the prediction of what the next token should be. So hang on, is your fuser an encoder decoder transformer? Um, so there's the, uh, that's one way. So yeah, like the, you can use an encoder decoder as the architecture, but yeah. it's pr more general than that. It's sort of like, it doesn't matter if it's an encoder decoder or just a standard left to right language model. You can still, run them in the same way. Okay. Some of them will be more efficient than others, except for uh, the next thing we'll talk about. So what I was saying is like in RAG, that's kind of how we did it. We took predictions for what the next token should be for mm -hmm. each document. Mm -hmm. And then um, you average effectively, and then you predict the next token, then you can repeat the whole process. Um, what we found since, which is work uh, led by my colleague, ex-colleague, uh, Gautier Isakar, uh, is that getting the model to have a cross attention 
or attention over both the query and the documents earlier improves the model a lot, which is why where the encoder decoder models come in. So Gautier and Edouard came up with this um, architecture called FID, or Fusion in Decoder, mm -hmm. which does use an encoder decoder model. And it works kind of like the way I described. Uh, so you concatenate the question with each document and you parallel process through the encoder. And then you take all of these latent um, encoded states mm -hmm. and you concatenate them effectively halfway up uh, through the model. So the decoder then attends on all of the encoded documents um, so that it can generate. So you kind of fuse in the middle mm -hmm. or fuse in the decoder. So that's what we call it, fusion in decoder. Um, that's a way of effectively avoiding the terrible memory complexity and time complexity that comes from concatenating all these documents in a super long line. Yeah. at the bottom, which would probably be the most optimal in terms of performance, maybe, we don't actually know that, um, but, or it would have the most powerful cross-attention layers, but obviously is difficult to do in practice. So yeah. Amazing, um, amazing. Um, unfortunately, I have to go in a minute, but no like, problem. just a final question, you've just like brought this question on. I've always wondered, you know, we've got this quadratic layer-wise complexity in Transformers, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like we just think that if we could have a Transformer with a huge input size, you know, we can ingest an entire book, mm -hmm. it would just be better. But that's not necessarily the case. Like, can you think of any limiting, like, for example, language might have some kind of explosive complexity, like with all of this kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, um, r relational structure that, and, and that might grow quicker than the representational capacity of a language model. So do, do you think that's super that's interesting? Yeah. So certainly a model that needs to process like an entire book in one forward pass will require more capacity in order well i'm not sure about that actually but i'll take a step back and say um we can't reason about it too much because that's just so different from how humans absorb information like you don't sort of like stare at a book laid out on a table and you're like okay um also you might need to like backtrack a bit more so uh I'm not sure a human does this, but, uh, but a language model is going to have to read the start and then it's going to reveal things about stuff that happens later. Hmm. So yeah, so a left to right language model, at least the ones that are like really popular, the, mm -hmm. the GPT style ones, um, will read the beginning and they won't revisit how they've interpreted the beginning by the time they come to the end. Yeah. So it's a little bit, suboptimal from that perspective. You, you'd kind of want reading to be a bit more active. This is something that Jason Weston um, argues for, is that reading is a bit more of an active process that you kind of read a bit, consume it. So I just keep going, it's the yeah, it's cool. working. Yeah. Uh, maybe summarize, yeah. um, you know, what you've read so far, put it into some sort of working memory or scratch pad or whatever people want to call it, mm -hmm. um, and then continue. And that's not something that we train a language model to do out of the box. So even if it's context window is really good. It, it might not have a great ability to process, say, the beginning um, without knowledge of the end. Uh, so you could have a big old bidirectional model that can do that. Mm -hmm. But again, it feels like the best thing to do would be read a chapter, for example, generate some sort of working memory of that, and um, then keep doing that effectively. So like your kind of process becomes given my summary and the next chapter, what's my next summary? And you kind of take the whole auto regressive language modeling paradigm and move it up to a, like a higher kind of level of operating on sequences. Um, I guess there's another separate issue, which is even if I could train a language model with this like incredibly long context window, do we have enough signal to train the model to actually use that information? Um, so we don't, we have lots of short sequences, like billions, trillions of short sequences. And we know that the next, like the, the, the most important tokens are the ones near the one you're trying to predict next, which is the signal that language models use to train. Um, as you go further and further away, there's this big old drop off in how important those tokens become. And to the point where you want to get a model that understands super long sequences, there's just so little data comparatively. Uh, for it to pick up on those signals. 
So you might need a super big language model that's got loads and loads of capacity just even to recognize um, or like be good enough at language model to, to, to be able to fit these last few really rare signals. Um, or you might have to fake it somehow and like artificially produce these very, very long documents um, so that a model can, can do well. Yeah. Amazing. Patrick, it's been an honor. Great thank to you. So much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, my, my driver's waiting outside. Um, that was really, really cool, man. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I think, I think it's okay. I'll just like chuck it, chuck it all in the bank. But yeah, that was awesome. Thanks a lot.